Welcome to Where's Wiseman. We're Matt and Emily, and in this video, we're sharing an epic road trip we took through Utah a few years back. We had the best time visiting the many national parks and monuments Utah has to offer and driving bucket list roads like the Schaefer Trail and Moki Dugway. bumpy trail huh <laughs> this is amazing so much fun this was our first time in the moab area and the scenery here is beautiful this steep incline was our first real test for the jeep and trailer but we made it up no problem if i can get my left tire up this up this ramp i'll have to hop up here a little bit We're only a few miles into Moab, first time ever, and I mean, I can't stop looking around <laughs> and tripping over rocks. <laughs> time to get cozy and eat some dinner? First night in Moab, this place, it's amazing. We can't stop looking around. We're not even two miles in to this area and already have done the most rock crawling I've ever done in this Jeep. <laughs> Such a blast. First spot we found was on top of a hill. I think along uh, Pole Road, Pole Line Road, I don't, there's a, a huge uh, viewpoint at the end. We didn't have time to hit that last night. But yeah, it's a uh, fun, uh, a little bit technical trail going up and there's another easier trail coming down. It looks like some vans have made it up here on the south trail, but uh, having a blast so far. So we saw this door in the side of this rock face from the road. And we wanted to check it out. Oh. What? What is it? Room. Oh, let me see. It's an old storage room, it looks like. Oh, weird. Okay, well, not as creepy as we thought. The next day, we made our way to Arches National Park. We didn't realize they had recently implemented a new reservation system, but luckily we managed to get a time slot for that day. Reservations are now needed if you plan to visit the park between April and October. Arches National Park is located five miles north of Moab and has over 2,000 natural stone arches, hundreds of soaring pinnacles, massive rock fins, and giant balanced rocks. Some of the most popular attractions include Park Avenue, the Window Section, Balanced Rock, Delicate Arch, and Devil's Garden. There's only one campground in the park and you can reserve campsites to stay between March and October. During busy season, the campground is usually full every night.
delicate arch has become a widely recognized symbol of the state of Utah and one of the most famous geological features in the world. There is an upper and lower viewpoint, which is what we did. The trail to see Delicate Arch up close and personal is three miles round trip. However, we had to get back on the road again to make it over to Devil's Garden. Devil's Garden is a region at the northern end of the park. Here you'll find arches, spires, and a large concentration of narrow rock walls called fins. Landscape Arch, which is the largest arch in North America, can be found within Devil's Garden and the easy trail is about two miles round trip. After an amazing day at Arches, it was time to find a campsite on BLM land near Marlboro Point, which is located near the north end of Canyonlands National Park. We chose to camp here not only for the amazing views, but also to set ourselves up for a quick drive to Dead Horse Point State Park in the morning. There are a ton of different roads in this area, and after a few dead ends, wrong turns, and no camping signs, we found a fun road with a perfect spot. Here's our camp spot for tonight. A little bit of a view out there. Uh, we wanted to get out to Marlboro Point, which I think is straight out that way, uh, but we ran into a sign that says no camping past a certain point. So we turned right and found another road and uh, this is where we're gonna end up. Good morning from Dead Horse Point State Park, or is it just Dead Horse State Park? I'm not Dead sure. Dead Horse Point State Park. <laughs> yeah, we're actually walking out to the point to get some epic views of the canyon. Um, today we're exploring canyon lands, the state park, and then probably Matt's favorite. Schaefer Trail. Yeah, we're gonna take the camper on Schaefer Trail. <laughs> You're pretty confident, right? It's gonna be fine? Yeah, just a road with sharp turns. Okay. Towering 2,000 feet directly above the Colorado River, Dead Horse Point State Park provides a breathtaking panorama of the sculptured pinnacles and buttes of Canyonlands National Park. There are two campgrounds within the state park and many great hiking and mountain biking trails. Perfect views, you have to come here. Uh, but we can actually see where we're gonna be most of today. So out to the west, that road coming down is Schaefer Trail. And it comes down into the valley here, goes along this ridge, and we'll end up on the other side of the state park later. How long is that supposed to take? A couple hours, you think? Yeah, it'd say a couple hours. We'll see. I don't know. Yep. 
Road, and, road looks nice and smooth from up here, but <laughs> you never know. Well, a little bit of a different story today, I'm trying to get into Canyonlands, then trying to get into Arches with the reserve tickets. Um, we've been sitting in a line for, what, half an hour-ish? For 20 minutes so far. <laughs> um, we think we're close to the entrance, but who knows? Island in the Sky is the easiest area of Canyonlands National Park to visit in a short period of time offering many pullouts with spectacular views along the paved scenic drive. The Island in the Sky Mesa rests on sheer sandstone cliffs over a thousand feet above the surrounding terrain. Every overlook offers a different perspective on Canyonland's spectacular landscape. We stopped to do a short loop hike to Mesa Arch, which is a cliff edge arch with views framing the canyon far below and the LaSalle Mountains in the distance. It is a classic sunrise spot and you're probably familiar with this iconic image. First time, really excited. I've wanted to do this trail forever. And uh, we're doing it for the first time with a teardrop trailer. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. It's tight, narrow, steep. Uh, should take about 30 minutes to get down to Schaefer Camp. Yeah, here we go. Within Canyonlands National Park is the Schaefer Trail, which is an iconic, challenging, unpaved backcountry road that descends 1,500 feet through a massive sandstone cliff. The trail began as a route made by Native Americans, then became a trail for sheep and cattle herders, followed by a road for trucks moving loads of uranium from the backcountry. The trail is named after John Schaefer, whose family is credited with improving the trail and making access into the canyon easier. Expanding upon the work of Schaefer, the Atomic Energy Commission widened the trail and extended it to the White Rim Road to accommodate trucks moving uranium-bearing rock down to Moab for processing. High-clearance four-wheel drive vehicles with a low-range gear are highly recommended, and remember uphill traffic always has the right-of-way. Just came down the switchbacks of Schaefer Trail in uh, Canyonlands National Park. Amazing road, you have to try it. Really all you need is all wheel or four wheel drive. It's very steep, sharp turns, but there's uh, quite a few turn offs. You just have to be smart, look down the trail, see if you see anybody, look up the trail and just take it slow. The uh, teardrop did great. Uh, just one two-point turn, but simple. A little bit of butt pucker here and there just because of the cliffs, but... <laughs> <laughs> what a trip! <laughs> All right, let's get to the rest of the trail. All right, go, go, go! <laughs> The road forks once you're down in the canyon, and you can continue on along White Rim Road or take the Potash Road, which is what we did. Some popular sights to see from the trail once you're down inside the canyon include Gooseneck Overlook and Thelma and Louise Point.
We had a few campsites planned for this area on BLM land. However, everywhere we looked, we ran into no camping signs. So we ended up trekking a bit further past the potash ponds and were able to grab the last site at a roadside campground along the Colorado River. Not quite what we planned, but it will do for the night. We made our way south through Moab for a quick stop for breakfast and then continued on to visit the Needles section of Canyonlands National Park. The drive from Moab to the park entrance is about an hour and a half with beautiful scenery along the way. The Needles forms the southeast corner of Canyonlands and was named for the colorful spires of sandstone that dominate the area. Over 60 miles of interconnecting trails offer many opportunities for long day hikes and overnight trips. Foot trails and four-wheel drive roads lead to such features as Tower Ruin, Confluence Overlook, and Elephant Hill. All right, it is day two for us exploring Canyonlands National Park. Saw some really cool things. Unfortunately, the road to, I think it's Elephant Hill, to really get close to the needles was closed for us. So that was kind of a bummer. And uh, we just don't have time to do long hikes. So we, we got to move on, yeah. but still got some great views. Area is amazing, beautiful. For now, back on the road. Monument Valley, here we come. Ah. We were very excited to make our way to Muley Point and find a campsite with views overlooking Monument Valley. We ended up at Muley Point East and there were plenty of campsites along the cliff. If you plan to go here, be prepared for wind. Okay. Let's unhook. How excited are you right now? This is, this is, uh, yeah. No words? Beyond, beyond belief. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Utah. BLM. Where are we? Oh, thank you, Glen Canyon. Don't want to roll off this hill. <laughs> Nerd. I'm gonna need some uh, additional. You gonna need some height and some rocks? Yeah. Close, 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 close. That'll do. All right, here's how we have everything packed. Chairs, table, bin of goodies. We did bring our gas fire pit. We weren't sure where we would end up and what time we might get there. So just easier some nights to do the gas. All right, we'll give you a little camp tour. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, it's not too windy. So a little kitchen set up here in the back. We've got the Jeep doing some wind block, it's coming that direction. And then obviously taking advantage of the view, great fire pit and a monument valley out there.
Oh, good morning. It's early, 6.45, uh, we're on the road. We're uh, trying to get to Monument Valley Forest Gump Point as soon as possible. Hopefully catch the sunrise over the monuments. But absolutely beautiful. We're at 6,300 feet and uh, no wind at all this morning. It's amazing. I'm actually in a t-shirt right now. It was 41 degrees when we woke up. Yeah, we're uh, six days in. No shower yet. <laughs> I actually had a dream last night. Everybody around me kept saying, what's that smell? And in my dream, I thought I was well-groomed and clean. And then I realized I was a smelly kid in class. <laughs> I immediately woke up and couldn't smell myself because I think I've gone uh, nose blind to my my own body. <laughs> we're gonna find showers today, right? We're gonna we're gonna seek some uh, some showers today. Oh, turns to dirt. Mokey Dugway, kill. The Mokey Dugway Scenic Byway is a remarkable stretch of road that runs along Utah Highway 261 and has literally been carved from a cliff wall. It's famous for its steep, unpaved, sharp switchbacks, which descend 1,200 feet from the top of Cedar Mesa. Monument Valley along the Utah-Arizona border boasts iconic landscapes and sandstone masterpieces that tower at heights of 400 to 1,000 feet. We just had to make a stop at Forrest Gump Point for that well-known shot before continuing on. There are plenty of pull-offs along the road to stop and take in the scenery, and you may even get lucky and see some wild horses. This was going to be a longer drive day and our ultimate goal was to camp somewhere around Zion National Park. But first, we stopped in Page, Arizona for showers and a visit to Horseshoe Bend. Zion National Park encompasses some of the most scenic canyon country in the U.S. We entered Zion through the east entrance, however, the south entrance near the town of Springdale is more popular. For most of the year, Zion Canyon Scenic Drive is closed to cars, and the shuttle buses taking you into the park leave from the visitor center at the south entrance. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get a permit to climb Angel's Landing, and the Narrows, which is another popular attraction, was closed due to high water levels. So we opted to hike the Canyon Overlook Trail and were rewarded with sweeping views of the valley. Thank you. We're making our way to the Canyon Overlook Trailhead. Cue epic footage. <laughs> Man, this is making me nervous. I don't know that I could do Angel's Landing. I think I'd be a big baby. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Didn't really uh, plan this out the, the best. <laughs> so far, flip-flop approved. Yeah, Matt's and flip-flops. We didn't bring water. I don't know, we... It's late in the day when we're getting into Zion. We are just are not thinking straight. for that first shower. All right.
The Zion Mount Carmel Tunnel provides direct access for travel between Bryce Canyon, Grand Canyon, and Zion National Parks. Construction of the 1.1 mile tunnel began in the late 1920s and was completed in 1930. Make sure to drive slow and check out the views from the windows all along the tunnel. We were fortunate that our timing lined up perfectly to be able to camp with some good friends who also happened to be on a long road trip. We decided to cut our visit to Zion short to be able to spend more time around the campfire catching up. Bryce Canyon is known for its hoodoos, which are irregular columns of rock formed by erosion. From the park entrance, the main road winds 18 miles along the plateau's edge until its end at Rainbow Point with many scenic overlooks along the way. Viewpoints along the first three miles provide access to views of Bryce Amphitheater, which is home to the greatest concentration of hoodoos found anywhere on Earth. Most of the hiking trails are also found in the Bryce Canyon Amphitheater area. One of the most popular is the Navajo Loop Trail, which begins and ends at Sunset Point. So one thing to note if you come to Bryce Canyon and you have a trailer or anything longer than 20 feet, uh, you can't take it past a certain point in the park. So we actually had to drop our trailer here at the parking lot, put the hitch lock on, uh, and then just took off in the Jeep, which was totally fine. Um, obviously it's still here, so uh, pretty safe and secure. So Matt's getting that uh, hitch back up. I just made us a quick lunch. And then I think maybe we'll do a hike or maybe we might hit the road, so we'll see. After taking in the sights at Bryce Canyon, it was time to get back on the road. We ended up driving a little over three hours and found a great dispersed campsite near Paul Bunyan's Woodpile in central Utah. We wanted to set ourselves up with just a couple hours drive in the morning to the Bonneville Salt Flats for some fun. If you're looking to take this route through Utah, there are tons of great dispersed sites in the area. We woke up before sunrise to make our way to the Bonneville Salt Flats in the northwest corner of Utah, which
which was the last stop on a road trip before heading home to Washington. The salt flats are about 12 miles long and 5 miles wide, covering more than 30,000 acres. Aside from the beautiful views, the Salt Flats are an international hub for car racing, and several speed records have been set at the flats, including a land speed record of 630 miles per hour, established in 1970. To get there, take exit 4 off Interstate 80 and follow the signs to the speedway. It's not as smooth as you think. Maybe in the summer it's a lot smoother, but it is really bumpy right now. Maybe the, uh, when it dries out more, the wind will smooth it out, but it's kind of like a washboard road. Let's see if you can uh, experience the wind with us. The salt flats were a little bumpy on this trip in April, and we imagine that warmer weather and wind in the summer months helps to smooth out the surface. We also definitely recommend stopping for a car wash after your time on the salt flats. You can camp on the BLM land surrounding the flats, and we did this on a more recent trip. It was over 100 degrees Fahrenheit and windy, but so much fun. Leaving the Salt Flats, we planned to drive about seven hours into Oregon to camp for the night. However, we soon discovered the area we intended to stay had a winter storm warning and we didn't bring any of our winter gear. Ultimately, we pushed through into Washington and spent the night with family. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions on visiting national parks in Utah, leave them in the comments below and be sure to subscribe for more content like this.